Alright, let's get this show on the road, baby! Woo! My name is Tim Vassar Bloom. This is the Tim Vassar Bloom Show. This is episode 8 of the program. My name is Tim Fisher Bloom. If I didn't already mention at the top of the show, this is the Tim Fisher Bloom Show. And this is episode 80. Can you believe it? Can you made it? Can you believe it? That I've been doing this 80 times. Nope. 79. Okay. That's how I started the last episode. I was like, can you believe I've been doing this 79 times? Can you get over yourself? But seriously, though, can you believe that I've put up with myself for this many episodes long without calling it quits? That's what I'm asking you right now. Can you believe that I put up with myself for 80 episodes? Never mind other people putting up with me. Uh, I got a high bar to impress myself. Other people are easy to impress. Other people you impress just by going like, hey! Hey, look at me! I don't know. It's not that hard to impress other people. If, like, in mass, sure. But even that, if you if you have no boundaries with like your own sense of, it's easier to impress other people than it is to impress myself. I mean, individually, way easier than like a group of them. A group of them. It depends. It depends on the situation. But in general, I don't know, I guess it's easier to, the more I think about this, it's actually a lot easier to impress myself than other people. I'm way more impressed with myself than other people are impressed with me. So I take that back. I'm a learn. I'm looking to learn. I'm a learner. I'm always looking to be proven wrong. I am hard to impress myself and I'm hard and I'm bad at impressing other people. I'm bad at impressing everybody. Let's just lay the line. Let's just level it out. Level level with yourself. I suck at everything. I suck at impressing myself and the world. Sometimes if I'm impressing myself, it's good enough for the world. Sometimes I think something sucks. And it does. And that's pretty much it. Very rarely do I do something that other people like that I don't like. Like maybe I'll think of a joke that works or something. If I, uh, But then I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm done with that. I don't know. I, I got, but then it's not that good if you just give up on it. To make something good, you got to kind of build it up into more than one thing. One punchline. If you're talking about a joke. Like a stand-up joke. If you're doing stand-up, it's like, oh, I thought of a punchline. It's like, okay, you could keep it. But then you got to remember that punchline and that's it. You just got to remember that one punchline. But what about the joke around it? Is there any other punchlines in the premise? It's like, nope. Just that one punchline. Well, look, great. So you got to remember just to do that two-second thing. Yep. So anyway, I suck at that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't mind being good at something. Something that pays the uh, dividends, like, ego dividends. Like, if you're good at stand-up, which is rare, if you're one of the few people that are actually good and able to produce good, whatever, I, I'm okay at it, but not at the part where you write jokes and build up the jokes. I'm just good at talking in a funny voice and stare, you know, making faces at the crowd. Like, like, oh, okay, oh, like saying funny, like saying stupid sounds. You know, I used to be very confident at how I would just go up there and just be like, oh, I'm going to do something stupid. I'm just going to be stupid. And that could be funny. You know, I'm funny in like a stupid, like I act like I'm just a stupid looking, per like I, I say stuff stupidly. But I don't know how to make that a profitable thing or even worth doing even for free. It got not fun a long time ago, about two years ago, to be exact. More than that, but anyway, I, I'm a, I'm a type of person who I do a hobby, and then I get super into it, and then I completely stop doing that hobby, and then I have to do something else. Like eat a big meal, I'll eat a big meal like Chinese food, 
And then I'll be like, oh, I've had enough Chinese food. I'm not going to have that for another month. It's a long time to go for not having Chinese food. Chinese food is pretty, it's one of the best cuisines, countries that have ever, like it's one of the best foods, Chinese. You know, there's pizza, there's other good countries food wise that have made that make good food and then the americanized version is what i all i am talking about i don't the hell they actually eat in china i know what i eat that i call chinese food and it's one of the best it's one of the best anyway i don't know what the point that i was currently that i was going for was but i guess the point was that uh, oh yeah i suck at uh, getting good at things because I get sick of the the boring parts, like put it in the effort and like every like the repetitive part, not the even like. Okay, I guess it is like because as they say you gotta grind, and I guess that's the part I hate is that the part that you have to repeat the same thing. Like exercise, I'll do one push up, but the second I do a second push up. It's like, well, I already did this. I'm, I don't want to do the same thing again and again, let alone a hundred times. So that's me. That's where I'm at. I like to do things once. Sex! We can't talk about this because this is YouTube. So let's not use that word. Get in, have it like bedroom fun. I've heard other people call it. Yeah, that also gets old if it's with the same person and it's the same style. So like Chinese food, you gotta only do it once a month to keep it interesting. Or with a different person. If I have sex with a different person, I could do it pretty much every single day. At least once a day. And not even feel like I'm bored or like doing work. If it's with the same person... In the same, like twice a day, I'll be like, well, you know, it's taken me a little bit of, like, uh, sex. Oh, whoops. I mean, bedroom fun, which let's be, I mean, I'm just calling it that as a, as a euphemism to not be too adult for the sponsors and the advertisements. When I say bedroom fun, uh, that could happen anywhere virtually anywhere not in the bed not only in the bedroom I, I i could do it in my family i could do it any, i could do it uh, in this room i could do it during the podcast i would just edit it out i would just cut it out and then you you would cut to a a, a scene of me immediately after where i am done having bedroom fun and then like i'm sweatier and just just go like the, in a flash. It's like, whoa, what happened? He was talking about something. Now all of a sudden he's sweaty. It's like, and I'll just be like, oh, I had a, a girl came by just as I was talking, just as I was finishing up that. Uh, anyway, you would probably see that part. You would see me get the tech. My phone's right. Like somebody could text me during like, and I'll just text them back. Anyway, the point is, is that would not harm the production of the show, I would just edit that part out and it would go on as as if nothing happened and it would probably enhance the show. Who I don't know. But I, usually if you're excited to have, if you're, if you're looking forward to it, it's probably better than if you just had bedroom fun. Uh, you're at your best creatively when you are looking forward to having bedroom fun. That's when your brain is like uh, firing on all cylinders because it's like, hell yeah, something is happening right after this or maybe even during this. So that's bedroom fun. And I, so I even with that, it's like, OK, we did it. I've done it with you and I've done it today with you. So give me a couple days. You know, I, I'd, I kind of want to just do my own thing. For a day or two, and then if there's nobody else or no nothing, you know, if there's nobody else, or if you come on to me in such a way that's so hard to close the door on of the bedroom, because sometimes, like, 
preferably it's them doing all the work, including starting it off the foreplay, the f before the yeah. I like to just I like the spontaneity. Anyway, and that's uh, how it goes for any hobby, lifestyle, activity between life and death. Doesn't matter like how important it is. Who doesn't matter if it's for survival or for pleasure. It's got to be exciting. Survival, just the fact that you're trying to survive something, that could become exciting enough where I'm going to be good at it. But it's only a certain, if it's, it just has to happen once. I'll get burnt out of surviving the same BS after a while, and I will probably just give up after a while, because there's got to be a thing to look forward to with the survival. Right now I'm in a survival situation. We're in a soft recession. I feel like we've been in a recession, but that's probably just because I'm not working this is my job, but this is not paying the bills. This is so far off from paying the bills that it's virtually not my job, but it is. I don't, I should take, you know, that's the thing. I don't take things seriously unless there's somebody riding me to be like, yo, you gotta do this. And even if they're paying me well, it'll get boring even then. It, like money can only go so far. But anyway, I, I, it's a recession. So I'm in a survival situation right now. And that's kind of exciting. That gets me out of bed. Because it's like, oh, you gotta get out of bed and think of something to uh, maneuver your situation around not having to pay, like, get a job. Because the bills, you do have to, yeah, you have to pay those. But you're not gonna get a job, obviously. Oh, you're the type of person that's gonna, like, all of a sudden, it's like, Oh, I would like to apply to your uh, this job opening. My name's Tim Weishelbaum. Here's my resume. So I don't, I don't do that. I'm an anti-work proponent and activist, slacktivist, to be fair. To the, I mean, to, you know, I'm a slack. I'm an activist who just talks about it and upvotes. I'm very for the anti-work movement, unless it's a good business that actually is good to their employee. It's actually not that, con like, I don't lean hard on the whole, like, screw all business owners. I just think they should treat their employees with a certain amount of respect and pay them the benefits that they can afford. You know, that's it. Just pay them a good salary and benefits and what they're worth and build a relate like a rapport. Nothing too crazy like a f family style. Like, oh, you I treat my employees like family, but kind of. That would be at best. But I'm not, you know, just not like dirt. So I'm a very anti-work guy. Because I don't think you should be working a job that doesn't treat you with respect. And it's a bygone era where you could just get a job off the street at a fast food establishment. Because everybody needs a job. So it's like those jobs are going to go to the most desperate people that are the most unskilled. Or even not. I don't know. They're, they still are the pretty unskilled. People that work fast food are pretty unskilled. If you want, but I, it's not like in uh, Breaking Bad or Salam, it's Salamanca. It's not like in uh, Better Call Saul or, you know, that chicken place, Pollo, Los Pollos, whatever it's called, with, with Gus Fring in charge of these model employees who show up and fast food ain't like that. It's, I don't, it's, it was like that probably in the 60s, 70s when like, middle class people actually worked fast food now it's all low class poverty employers employees people basically in poverty that work at fast food but uh why is that i don't know do we have to i mean that's just because they are willing to work for that price for the minimum wage it's legal and i don't see so what's the problem it's not taking jobs away from anyone else. It's 
but it, you know, like, cause the people that I'm like middle class people, the anti workers, like me, I could never take that job. So who cares if it's being worked by, uh, like, people like people that aren't even citizens? I don't care. Somebody's got to do it. I need my McDonald's. Anyway, that's all. But anti work, I'm very for it. For, for certainly for me, because I'm middle class by nature. It's in my g genetics to be middle class, a and it's in my upbringing. More importantly, I have a work ethic, but only for about two hours, only for a few hours of the day, and I have to be on Vivant, and it's only for stuff that isn't really work. I'm sorry, but I feel like it feels like work. I ain't going to do it. If I'm on Vivance, I'll do stuff that's fun. That's like, ooh, like investing, looking at my investment portfolio. Yeah, that's not work, but it's, uh, it's all I could. It has to be something fun that is rewarding, immediately rewarding, or maybe long-term but it's rewarding just to be like, okay, I'm working towards something. I, I don't, I can't do work. I'm an anti-worker only because, like, in the sense that what I just laid out, I don't have to rehash because I don't want to get a job with a bad employer, which most of them are. It's also in the sense that my work ethic is uh, non-existent. It's non-existent. I had, you know, I can. Yeah, and that shows in how I take care of myself. Like, my house has never been cleaned officially. I only clean it one little square centimeter at a time. Pretty much like, you know, like a, maybe like one square foot at a time at the most. This is rounding up. Like on a day-to-day -day basis, I'll be like, oh, that's a spot that, that that's a dusty spot right there. I'll clean that square, you know, just something I can just grab a paper towel. Which oh, this brings us to the first topic of the show. Paper towel, so the economy is bullsh is intense right now. It's it's ten we're in a soft recession. I'm feeling it in I'm feeling the pain of the recession. Because uh, paper towels, I don't use sponges. Anything that's not disposable, I don't. Pre, you know, I don't. I don't use. So paper towels are my go-to for anything involving getting stuff done, eating, cleaning. What else in life is there? Yeah, I use paper towels for eating and cleaning. I like to. I always have a paper towel near me as a napkin. I put it underneath something if something's gonna make a mess, you know. Uh, and anything that needs to be cleaned, whether it's the floor, the wall, anything, paper towel. So the economy is really bad right now because this the consumer price index is off the chain it's off the charts paper towel what is this are we in a, uh, a pandemic how is it that paper towels are now 43 dollars for 16 rolls i'm not exaggerating i just looked this up i have it written down here because i didn't want to exaggerate it 43 dollars for 16 rolls of paper towels. That's not that many rolls. Think about that. 16. Six, like they're this big. 16 of those. Okay, that's a lot. That's enough to last me a few months. But $43 is not a small amount of money. Picture 220s. Somebody hand you 220. That's a lot of money. And that's not even enough. Plus tax. And three dollars. That's a fistful of money. And that's just for paper towels. I don't care if it's a hundred rolls. It's still a lot. Even for a hundred rolls, because you're paying forty-three dollars. Now that's like big money. 
I don't care who you are or what, what your income is, where you live. $43 is a lot of money for anything. It's, it's a lot of money to spend on something that just is just dissolved. It's just like paper. So we're in a recession, whether you like it or like, that's my definition of a recession. When paper towels cost what electronics cost, like 43, you could buy like a f- nice microphone for 43 dollars, you know, like $43 is more than pretty much anything should cost unless you're doing something professionally. Okay. Like this part, like everything could be done for $43. Anyway, that's paper towels. So that's the finance, just the beginning of the finance update. I mean, I could get more into it. I'm still jobless. This is my, this is technically my profession. But I have, I don't monetize it because I'm polite to society. And it's not even, it's not that. It's not a politeness. It's out of ineptitude. It's, it's, uh, it's ineptitude. It's not knowing how it's just not, uh, grinding. I don't, I don't like grind. I haven't put out any clips recently, even though I've made banger clippable. I've done plenty of things that are clippable in the past few episodes, but I can't bring myself to sit at the editing booth and scrub through it and be like, okay, that's a funny because my brain just goes, no, it's not, it's not funny. You're not funny. Nothing about y- your life is funny or should be celebrated as content. It's just like, no, I feel like I'm just living like off the radar. I'm not worthy of being tracked as a person. You know, I still need to pay bills because I live in an expensive my life is still expensive, but it's for what? It's like, it's so not worthy of being shared with others. So welcome to my podcast where I talk about my life to other people and share it with others. It's going, it's fine. Like I'm not doing anything that is like leading me down a negative. Like it's, it's, I'll get through it. But the economy's down where I'm stagnated. I'm drinking this purple water. Because I'm a kid. It's got to have purple in it for me to drink it. Because otherwise it's too boring. I need Like everything has to have a little bit of sweetness to it to get my attention. Including just water. I can't just drink regular water. I'm not a hydro homie. I'm for being hydrated and drinking six cups at least every day of this type of water, but to, but it's got to be like sparkling and it's got to have a ton of added, you know, sweetener in it. So that's pretty, uh, not, I don't think that's what they preach. I think they just want you to drink water, regular water. Nah, I'm an addict. And I'm a sober person who's struggling to get through this recession and doesn't have positive cash flow to do what I want to like, well, you know, to go crazy, like be influent, like, you know, there's plenty I could do without money, but like the pro, do I even have any projects I would do with money? No, I would probably just leave the house more. I would just leave the house more. And be a little more social. I don't know. I would try to get something going with that. But uh, anyway, sober. Let's do a quick sober update. Because it's still the whole reason I kind of... This, this podcast gets me... state keeps me on track. With sobriety. I would, ne- I would not want to let myself down. By going back to alcohol... And being a raging person that just lets everything come out that they think it it's more fun, but you don't build real 
friendships. So I'd rather have none, like no real connections, uh, or than like ones that you get just by meeting people while while drunk. Because it's harder. I don't know. I'm going for what's harder right now, and I'm not making tons of progress. But I'm also have I haven't lost prior at you know, progress. I haven't backtracked. I've been sober from alcohol for a year and like eight months. It's over six hundred days, some of like that six hundred and fifty something. I don't know. It's it's over six hundred, and I haven't wavered on that because the second I waver, it it'll be really hard to. I don't know, I'm one of those people. It's like, oh, I broke the streak. Now I might as well just keep doing it. I'm a different person, kind of, without alcohol because it takes me so much more to actually say what I'm thinking. So that stops me from saying a lot of things because I usually have something that I'm thinking to say about a situation, but usually... It's really negative, so it's better to probably not say it. And alcohol would just make me say it, which is fun, but not if you're sober. If you say negative things while sober to other people, they just go, "Oh, you're a Debbie. You're a curmudgeon. You're a bitter Debbie Downer." So anyway, it's not. So I just don't say anything anymore. Usually, so I just, I just, if I'm around other people. And I'm sober, which I am. And they're having, you know, saying, having, a, you know, going, saying a bunch of things. I, you know, usually I just say nothing unless it's interesting, which is usually not. Usually it's not. The only thing that's interesting to me is like somebody getting in trouble, like gossipy stuff, like, oh that happened, oh shit, that guy turned out to be a bad guy, like somebody assaulted somebody oh that's fun to talk about who oh i always knew they were a douchebag or something douche nozzle but that's about it other than that i just don't have anything to say so i just don't say anything so i've been doing a lot of that and that, that kind of started with the alcohol I don't, even before that it wasn't just from alcohol it was from just like gr getting like I don't know. Like, people are obnoxious. Who haven't grown as much as... Like haven't gone through the cynicism. Like haven't been exposed. Jaded is the word I'm looking for. The people that are not jaded yet with uh, life. Like they're still excited about life. I haven't been that person in a few... In a while. In a few years. You know since the economy was booming as soon as it collapsed i haven't really been the type who is like excited you know like oh man it's gonna be so exciting things are going i can't wait for uh november or something like i can't i am excited for the weather to change because we're in a heat wave and it's oppressively hot but it's, i don't have i don't go anywhere i can't go anywhere because my car is still in the body shop having its body worked on when a part comes in from Toronto. That was a sober update. I was a sober from weed. Haven't done mushrooms in a few weeks. I like mushrooms. They do make me kind of excited about being alive. But they make me so soft they make me sympathetic emp that's the emp they make me empathetic forget about sympathetic i wish i was only symp sympathy is a dumb sympathy is a fake emotion nobody has sympathy they have empathy sometimes that's the only thing that's actually has like substance to it sympathy is like oh i don't know what that feels like losing your family in a typhoon in a typhoon typhoon 
yeah, whatever the word is. I know typhoon. I don't know what that's like to lose your loved one in a disaster, but you have my sympathy. Because I know intellectually wise that I wouldn't have wanted that to have happened to me. So I'm sorry. I have sympathy. No, you don't. Sympathy is not a real emotion. It's just a thing that it's that you pretend to do. It's a facade. It's a it's a fake emotion. It's fake. Empathy is something that you do feel, and uh, that's the way, and uh, it's like, oh, I know what that feels like. So uh, I feel what you're feeling, and you feel that on mushrooms, whether you like it or not. You can't just power through the empathy. You can't be confrontational. You can't on mushrooms. For me, it, it, once they take their hold, it levels me out, makes me feel gratitude for everything that I have. My health, whatever, makes it gives me gratitude. So it takes away that, like, fight or flight. It's just like, yeah, whatever happens, happens. It takes... It's like, I don't need to be in survival mode. If somebody's mean to me, it's like, whatever, I get it. I If I was them, I would, I, 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 I just see, like, yeah, cool. But then it wears off and I go right back to my angry, you know, I have the ego. Uh, whatever, but ego's dumb. You just tell yourself, oh, that's dumb. It's You don't always have it when you're, just think if how you are when you're on mushrooms. And then it, it's possible to override but then again, you kind of want the ego to prove the world that you are good enough. And that fuels you. Like, you kind of do have to get your grit and drive from somewhere. And ego, I think, has a, a cap to it. So you got to break through the ego to reach your fullest potential. You have to admit when you're wrong. So anyway, that's the sober update. I'm still chronically sober and have this this feeling in my bones of like like super heaviness and it's not getting any better i i just have to take you know the vivance is good a little bit stimulants but coffee i'm not doing coffee i love it i love drinking it and i love mixing stuff in it to make it keto to make it like a meal it goes great with the vivance when it kicks in. It's like it just feels so uh, smooth and like like chill and like excited and just taking data. You just want to look stuff up and learn and look at numbers, look at spreadsheets. Yeah, not a, like just be like, oh man. What's happening in the news? You just you just feel plugged in, terminally online. But anyway, but then a couple of, like you know, then it just wears off after like twenty minutes. Coffee's like weed; it wears off after twenty minutes, and then you just have this, this like buzzy like this. It's not it's not easy to describe, but it's like this feel of like, uh, fuzzy. Uh, it's bad. Not jittery. The jitteriness is usually, I associate with like the good part of it where you're like, you feel like, oh man, I gotta, I'm like, it's this tense, yeah, it's a, it's like this anxiety. Yeah, and it's bad, and so I haven't been doing much coffee. So I have to do other stuff. But anyway, but yeah, so I need something, man. But anyway, sober update, still sober, that's why I'm not acting a fool. That's just what I was talking about. Like people that, that are still excited about life. That aren't cynical. They haven't. They are more annoying to us older folk. And I used to not get that. I used to be like, look at these older guys, not crack a smile. You know, not have the same sense of humor as younger guys. Like when I was younger, I was like, laugh. I thought other stuff was funny. I thought stuff was funny, and it's fine to think stuff is funny. 
But as you get older, what you find funny becomes... I don't... Maybe it's not that... Okay, you get more mature, so it's you don't laugh at the same stuff. But also, your sense of humor just turns off for most of the time. You still could find a huge range of things funny once it's turned on. The problem is that getting your sense of humor to turn on, I haven't figured out the easy way of doing that. It takes work. I got to plow through the BS and then I, once I turn it on, I do think a lot of stuff is funny. Like almost everything. I mean, oh, it's funny. Uh, yeah, stupid stuff too. But like it's just not, I don't present it. I'm, I just can't present it to other people because it fades away. Right after I think of it, it's like, oh, that's a funny line. And then you, it feels so good to think of a new funny line. But then, usually before it even comes to sh the time that I'm on stage, it's already gone. I already go like, oh, this was it's not funny anymore. Even though it's it, it should be. It's just that my sense of humor, dry, it, it's now in the off position. The weight just pulls everything towards the off position. It takes a lot more fuel to get me to look at the world through those glasses the like through the funny mirror you know what do they call those so anyway very that, that's just how i am very, you know I, I have a very crusty outlook but we don't gotta talk about what i'm not good at what i if i what i am i good at for god's sake well getting humbled how about that learning no I don't know, man. I'm still, I want to like prove, I want to like be the best or like, I want to be relevant. I don't know. That will go away too. I just, I need something that I'm not getting and it's, uh, it's not great. I feel kind of stuck, kind of like in a very bad place right now, um, with like stagnation. I'm stuck in this heat wave. I can't go out of the house unless I somehow get an Uber, which this is not an accessible place for Uber, so it costs a lot of money. So I'm stuck at home in the 100 degree weather, and time's going by. It's fine. It's just when I think about all the things I'm not doing at the end of the day that it gets tough to be like to be satisfied. It's like Shit is a waste. I'm waste. This is a waste of my life. Just time is going by. I'm not doing nothing. I'm doing some things that I'm proud of. I'm doing other hobbies. I'm doing plenty of hobbies, but not. They're not. They're they're one uh, player hobby. So anyway, but I'm gonna look back at this as like, okay, I, what did I get? I learn. What did I learn? I don't know. Hopefully, it's productive. Because when I, I'm going to be in my 40s in just a few years, in, nothing, in a snap, snap of the fingers, it's like, wow, I'm in my 40s. Look how little I have going for me. I'm just a lone wolf. So anyway, we'll, hopefully I'll think of something that sticks. Because you need purpose in life. You can't just be a lone wolf your whole life and expect it to be pleasant. You gotta do something that perforates the outside world. And I think that's why there's so many crazy people. Like, not, you know. That's one of the reasons. Isolation is not good and not having a purpose. Not good. So, anyway, I'll get through it. I'm, I, I have, like, this thing of, like, okay, where would I want to be? I look at it. Whenever I hear about a city, I go, oh, what, what would that be like to be in that to be there? I'm into geography. I like looking at maps. I like looking on Google Earth. It's like, oh, I was looking about the the. I, I learned about the uh, the Erie Canal, a historical canal that allowed ships to go from the ocean to the Great Lakes, and then they replaced it with a different canal that's better. 
and it goes from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. It connects all the Great Lakes to the ocean, not just some of them. So the Erie Canal is deprecated, it's defunct. We don't need it anymore. It's just for tour it's just a historical attraction. But it's still interesting to know that, that, that it's still there. And that it's in like but like some people just have it going through their backyard. It's like, oh that's the Erie Canal. It's like, oh, it just looks like a very nondescript passage, like a little river, very little creek or something. But anyway, it's famous. And I was like, how the heck do ships get all the way from Duluth, Minnesota, which is the most inland bay, what do you call it? shipping place that you could ship something uh, to the ocean? You could go all the way from Duluth, Minnesota on Lake Superior, which is also the biggest city on Lake Superior. It's not very many big cities on Lake Superior. You could, you could have a shipping freight freight freighter go from there all the way to the ocean but it has to go through such a long path it has to go through like all these different it has to go through all the way through montreal by the time it gets to the damn ocean it has to go through I don't know all the places all the great lakes pretty much it has to go through all of them and then finally it goes through Quebec but it's just fascinating to read about Sault Ste. Marie and I was reading about shipwrecks which I guess will be the main topic of this episode is shipwrecks because we've been getting inundated with uh, news about uh, the Titanic because another ship much smaller submersible called the Titan not the Titan, Nick, just the Titan, foolishly named after a cursed ship. I don't believe in curses. Naming it the Titan wasn't the reason it, it got collapsed. It was because they didn't follow science. Like, I don't believe in uh, superstition or anything like like that like that i just because they didn't follow the science it's not because they named it the titan it's because they thought they could use a composite material that's experimental and they sh could have just tested it a little but no i had a people in it and i don't that would suck to be in there even if it wasn't doomed if it even if they didn't die it still would have sucked excuse me it would have been because it has this tiny little porthole that they would have had to squeeze past each other like, okay can i see now through the eight inch porthole at the very front and that's it like, oh i got a tiny glimpse of the titanic through a bunch of muddy seawater that's all that's cloudy Oh, great. That's that's what it looks like in pictures. And I'm there, though. It's like... And it's so... Uh, cramped. It seems very unpleasant. I would have rather gone with James Cameron. Because at least if he dies, you die with the guy that made all these movies. He's not going to die. He's a god of guardian angel. So like, you know. Like, so they were dumb. The guy that was in charge, the, the CEO, was very hubristic. Very. And that's why he died. It was very, you know, the arrogance is what killed him. And that's what happened with the Titanic. But this Titan thing, this tiny little submersible being in the news cycle reinvigorated reignited my fascination with the Titanic when I was a kid I guess I, I was pretty interested in the Titanic uh, pretty much around when the movie came out the best version of the movie the 97 James Cameron version of 
the movie Titanic. His take on the whole shebang was mesmerizing as a kid. I couldn't wait to see it. I was already hooked on the whole meme of the whole topic itself at Titanic. I wasn't into any other shipwreck because none of them are as sexy. We do have to mention the Edmund Fitzgerald because that one died on Lake Superior, which I was just talking about, and that's kind of why I was reading about the uh, the canal system and the the locks getting the boats down to the, the sea level. It's fascinating. But anyway, it died. It, the Edmund Fitzgerald is a more modern shipwreck that was mysterious. It's like all of a sudden it's gone. But the Titanic, I was super interested in in 1997 as a seven year old. And then the movie came out, and I, we finally watched it by the time it was on VHS. And it was an amazing. It lived up to the hype. And so I, it instilled this emotion in me that was so. It, like it permeated my soul. When you watch Titanic, 1997, directed by James Cameron, if, unless you have. You have no soul. You're going to be very misty-eyed by the end of it. It's just going to pull you into the world. And you're going to be like, it's so beautiful. The emotion, mostly because of the soundtrack. The emotion in the, in the cinematography and the acting and the way it takes itself seriously. But is that it's, it's earnest. And it's nostalgic because it's 30 years old. It's, you know, a very old film at this point. It's 25, 26 years old. So that has it baked in. If you rewatch it now, you it's like, wow, this I was seven when this came out. And even then I was fully immersed. And now watching it as a 30-something-year-old. Yeah, they looked young. Jack's character looked super young. But the charisma, it holds up because uh, it's, it's, it pulled me in. There's some parts of it that are so hard to get through. You know, like even the part, like even the good part, like, I don't know what I liked. What did I like about it then? I liked, what I liked about it, rewatching it was the parts I didn't remember. All the famous parts, like, oh, I'm the king of the world, like, whoopee. Okay, with the kiss, when they, like, the I'm flying scene, that was good. That was good because the music kicked in. Whenever the soundtrack kicked in, I got misty eyed. And now my headphones, I got misty eyed, like, just whenever that the soundtrack kicked in even in the very beginning part it's such a powerful soundtrack that it, it did all the heavy lifting so anyway but then there was parts that's like oh this part where they're stuck where they're underwater almost and they have to get through the stupid gate the locked gate in third class off of the, off of Scotland Road the hall because I've been reading a lot about Titanic, so I know that the hallway is called Scotland Road. They got trapped and just they barely made it. That part is just suspense, it's just anxiety. That part, you don't rewatch it for that that shit. So yeah, only the parts I was like, oh, I don't remember. I don't remember this part at all. Like when she was gonna jump overboard over the stern. I did not remember that part. I didn't remember that she was suicidal at the beginning of the film. And that Jack just nonchalantly, oh man, well, I hope, can you not, I mean, can you not do that? Just because I'm going to have to jump in after you. See, I could never play that role because I would, or any role even close to something that's involving being charming or romantic i could because I, that's how i would sound i'd be like, can you not do that because then i'll have to jump in after you 
And I don't want to get cold. Lady. Come on, lady. Are you want, aren't you attracted to me? But anyway, he was a perfect, you know, he was a too good to be true character. He was like an alien. Like there was no record of him existing. So it's such a fairy tale that it's like, okay, it's just a movie. It's a, So you do feel kind of dumb afterwards when you realize how f uh, unrealistic it was. It's like, okay, he had no papers, no record of him existing anywhere in America. You couldn't find nothing, his school. Okay, so he it's like he might as well have not existed. And he was obviously meant to die because what if he survived? They would have gotten married in Wisconsin. And then he just would have grown old and it would have been an old version of him. It's like, that's not as hard hitting if they just survived. So it's good that he died because it makes it a good poignant. It's like, okay, yeah, he's a, he's not, he's too good for this world. Like people like him, if he did exist, they don't live very long because they do stupid stuff. He did a lot of stupid stuff in that movie. He was going to jump overboard for some lady. Uh, okay, that's about everything else. I mean, I, I, okay, I, I guess he didn't do anything that stupid. He didn't do anything that stupid. He was just charming. And he punched a guy a few... I don't, I don't know. He was smart. He actually was the smartest guy in the movie, pretty much. Like, he knew immediately... Like, he was a very optimistic guy. I can't believe I'm talking this long about the tight, about the movie tight, about the stupid James Cameron. He was the smartest guy on the boat, almost, except for that Andrews, uh, that Andrews guy. The guy that designed the boat was pretty smart. He knew it was going to sink very quick, and he was like, okay, they're just lifting that from a different film. A Night to Remember, they, they lifted the dialogue. Uh, they're like, yeah, it's going to sink. He's like, it, it, it got five of the the chambers, uh, the bra, whatever the hell you call it. It's going to sink. It's definitely going to sink. It's a mathematical certainty. They lifted that from the other film. But anyway, Jack and Rose were super smart characters. Jack knew immediately that something was wrong. When they heard them over talking, the captain was like talking about how some, and that's the only thing he said in the whole film that was like negative. He was like, oh, that's not good. Other than that, he had, you know, okay, I guess he was also freaking out right before that. He was freaking out about trying to see this woman after he got framed. I don't remember the chronology of when he was freaking out. He was like, I, I just want to see her. I just want to see her. But there was a, that's when he looked like desperate. So I guess he did look desperate. for. A few, who cares? He's gone. He's dead. Doesn't matter how many times they tried to uh, get on the uh, stupid flotation device or get on the debris field yeah of course he could have found another piece of debris he could have just tied a bunch of dead people together with their life jackets and used them as flotation devices but yeah he, he was meant to die because they made the story better okay that do I, I still talk that's just the movie the titanic i was so enamored with that movie the second time I watched it in the beginning is amazing because it starts off in the present day and forget about the characters just the way that they show the the actual wreck underwater in 1997 on film so it holds up in HD you can see their underwater footage of the actual Titanic. They land their mere watercraft submersible 
on the damn Titanic. It makes a bunch of noises. I don't know how the hell they got the noises, but they filmed it with actual cam, like movie cameras, film. They had to make a box, you know, a uh, enclosure to protect it from the water pressure. That was amazing. Watching them use the ROV, uh, the robot thing, go off the submersible and go down into the the wreck, into the hole that the skylight left from where the grand staircase was. They went down to the reception. They went, they went into the captain's whatever, all these different individual rooms. I didn't even realize that the wreck was that intact. Like I just thought it was just a piece of mush. I never looked that deeply at like how intact it still is. Like yeah, it can still go. Like it still looks like a ship. It still it still has a ton of different individual corridors and whatever. It's a huge. You know, the the bow is still in good shape. The stern, forget about it. Totally pancaked. Anyway, the ROV scene is incredible. The fa- and then they had, you know, because they, they filmed the ROV with a separate camera. So you, you just, it was already, you were already in the room. This haunted room. You're just there and you watch this robot come in. It's like, holy crap, I'm in the Titanic. And that's what it feels like because you are. It's, it's, it's filmed in high quality 35 millimeter film. That's a great opening to a film. It holds up for that reason, especially because the, the, the wreck is only deteriorating as time goes by. So that alone was like, holy crap, forget about the stupid sinking and all that, like the, the, the storyline. I just want to watch this documentary, but it's not a documentary. It's, it's even better because it has the aspects of a documentary where they say a bunch of true shit. In the CGI, they show like a they show an animation of how it sunk, and that is historically accurate. So even before the thing starts, uh, I'm already like googling stuff. It's like, was that real? Was that the real Titanic? Did they actually send? Hollywood cameras down there and, and like, yeah, it turns out. Yeah, that's why he was down there so many times was... Anyway, so that's the film itself. It's a magical film that's not overrated and The soundtrack is impeccable and one of the best soundtracks of any film of my lifetime if not the best soundtrack the only thing that would maybe be better is Lord of the Rings. Like whenever that shit comes in. And then. How do you not get a boner. When that shit comes in your, in your heads. So Lord of the Rings would probably be first just because it has two banger hits okay fucked it up i got it confused with the first one but anyway i don't have to you get the point it's a good it, it charges you up it gives you a boner that and then it gives you that nostalgia it's like Holy! I I remember when I was young, like I had my whole life ahead of me, when this came out, and now all movies have black people and all these white, you know, it's all diversified. It takes the fun out. It takes the magic out of it. It's like, oh yeah, that was just an actor that they hired to make it so black people could enjoy it too. Oh, thank you. So no more movies for white people then. Anyway, but that so the the nostalgia, but then the 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 my heart will go on song. Probably number two best soundtrack of all time for me in my lifetime. And then Casablanca. I, I tried watching Casablanca last night. It's boring. I couldn't get through. It kind of lost me. 
I need to be educated by other people on why it's worth watching, but even then, it's so boring compared to the new cinema that that's colorful and Anyway, so that's just the film Titanic. Then I got into just learning about the Titanic itself because it turns out it's a true story. It's based on something that actually happened. And then there's the conspiracy theory of like, oh, was that actually the Titanic or was it her sister ship? Uh, the Olympic. The Olympic was it the was it an insurance scam run by J.P. Morgan and all or someone else? Like it's just fascinating that people question if it even happened or if the titanic if that's actually the boat that's down there it just makes you go like why is that ex was there ever even a boat called the titanic or are all these people lying well we don't know it happened 111 years ago so i went into a deep dive pun intended whenever someone says not like no pun intended they're bullshitting they meant it. They could have not said the pun if they didn't intend to make the... Anyway, so pun intended. I did a deep dive on the Titanic, just gobbling up any YouTube like video about it. Just any little question you might have about it. Like, I don't know. Are they... Like, why don't they raise it? Uh, like, I don't know. Just any little nuance, like... Why, like, is this true? Is this myth true? Like, why did people think it didn't break in half until a hundred years later? So, because it was dark. You couldn't see your own hand in front of you that night because it was a moonless night. And so they had the stars outlining it. They had a silhouette. That's it. Same with the reason they couldn't see the ice. They couldn't see the iceberg until it was too late. Because all it looked like was a black void in the horizon. And they didn't have binoculars. I don't even think the binoculars would have helped. This is also something I learned because the binoculars is, are only helpful for if, for if you already spotted something. They're, they aren't helpful if you're just already, if you're not, if you don't know what you're looking for. So your naked eye are the best thing for an iceberg. But they shouldn't have been going that fast. They didn't heed the warning from the Californian. And the Californian didn't heed their uh, distress signals. So the Californian, I mean, they got no excuse. You know, they, all their excuses are bunk. But that's what made the history the history. Yeah, it was avoidable, but we wouldn't be talking about it. It wouldn't be as famous. It's only the most famous shipwreck by a million miles because of how many things had to go right and wrong. It was the maiden voyage. That ship was brand new and, and it just got everything. Oh, it's the first time we're doing this. And this oh, is a beautiful room, beautiful dining area and all these passageways and, and decorative. It's just, okay, now it's at the bottom of the sea forever three days after its launch it's like, so that's so it's just i can't get enough of consuming this topic and it would be cool to have like a, a mug that was trenched up drenched dredged up from the bottom from the debris field or from the inside of the boat itself that'd be cool to have a artifact that was from the actual wreck but that give me some bad juju because it's a grave site for 1500 people and people would be like Ugh, that's not respectful you know and it, it, it would be haunted too probably but it'd be kind of cool like yo man this this mug is from the titanic though it sunk the titanic dog. that's why it's that's why it's off that's why it's like discolored and tarnished okay it would be cool for them to at least dredge up the wine. All those unopened champagne bottles and wine bottles. How are you going to leave? Come on. If you're going to dredge up anything, at least get those up so they can auction. So they can at least like auction off them to millionaires and billionaires. Because it's cool. 
I don't know, just so they could talk about it on YouTube and review it on YouTube. If it's just going to some private collection, that's boring. But, you know, auction it off with the caveat that they have to at least show all of them on YouTube first before auctioning them. And then they would probably be, you know, sold later on. Not, like, opened that often. Anyway, I would try it. I would want to try. Everyone would want to try that. It would probably be delicious. 111-year-old wine that was sitting at the bottom of the ocean for 100... That's just how long it's been on the ocean. Who knows when it was bottled itself. Could be 200-year-old wine. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. And then I was re- you know, re- watching everything there was about the time it was discovered. When Ballard discovered that thing, that was a huge news story. So it's like watching the coverage from that was pretty fascinating. Just he, anyway, and and he wants to discover uh, Amelia Earhart's wreck, and I don't, I I don't know if they found it or not. There's pictures of what looks like her plane, but I don't think it's definitive. But anyway, that's about it. That that's as much as I could think to say about the Titanic. And they didn't do anything wrong with the design. And the lifeboats, they it's not that, it, you know, the boat itself was meant to be the lifeboat. Because if it flips over, there goes half your lifeboat. So, like, even if you did have enough, it has to sink in the right way. So you got to expect to lose some of them. And it was from pilot error. It was from bad... Uh, captain, captain me, uh, bad sailorship, whatever you call it. It was from being a bad boat person who drives boats. It wasn't from the design. So it was not unsinkable, but it was a good design. And anyway, so that Andrews guy, uh, I forgot his first name, but he was a good guy, good ship designer. He didn't deserve to die. Like, I don't get the whole dying with the ship things. Like, I get the captain kind of doing that because he's the captain. But the guy who designed it, yeah, he didn't have to go down with the ship. That was very honorable of him. And the Ipsme guy, the guy who owned it, the guy who named it, like that guy was portrayed as like a bad guy for jumping ship. But... And he was like depressed from that. For his, it totally ruined his life. So I guess he might as well have just died. But I think that's a disgrace that they uh, shamed him. Because, whoa, I'm supposed to die. Oh, just because the captain hit an iceberg and, and destroyed the, and caused it. That, that's my fault? Oh, so I'm supposed to just die. Because the captain's an idiot? Okay, so anyway, I think that's it. My so that's about it. Gratitude is the theme. I love. I am gratitude gracious. Uh, what makes me gracious is Bing, the website Bing. It's the default thing that opens when you open up Microsoft Edge, and it always shows you news stories about other people's misfortune. So whenever you know, literally every day, some actor some somebody that used to be somebody dies you know and i go okay i'm glad i'm not them at least i'm still alive and i have a little bit of life ahead of me to enjoy myself even if i'm not anybody so that's what gratitude is it's taking it's relishing other people's misfortune and making yourself feel better about what you have and don't have so anyway and my miata as i mentioned is still in the is still out of service is sitting in the hot sun and in the outdoors unfortunately in a body shop and in other news trump is in some deep water pun intended deep water he's going down like the titan ick 
He's going down like both of those boats. More like the Titanic because it's not like an implosion. It's a slow descent. And he's going to snap. He's going to he's going up right now. And soon he's going to snap. And the stern is just going to barrel downwards and get ravaged. So anyway, I am st still probably going to vote for him. Uh, but it's very early in the election. So I just wanted to mention it to show that I am aware of it. I do keep up to date on that news. So anyway, this has been episode 80 of the Tim Vikes of Bob Show. And have a good rest of the week. Peace and love.